Hello, and welcome back for another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with is Dr. Justin Bathin. So Justin, can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure, I'm an associate professor at the University of Kentucky. I've been there 12 years. Uh, when I got to the University of Kentucky, we really built out a lot of strength in technology leadership, I'm hosting a center called CASEL. We still are a co-host of CASEL. Um, and so we did that work for quite a while. And, and over, the last, uh, over the last decade, there's been sort of a slow transition in my work towards deeper learning, progressive learning. Uh, I lead a center called the Center for Next Generation Leadership with a team. And we do a lot of school transformation work mostly in Kentucky. We're really focused on transforming Kentucky. Um, but so we, we have deep relationships all over the state with a lot of P12 schools. Included in those transformations are technology transformations. And so uh, that's a thing that we've been working on over the last year. Okay. And in the interest of full disclosure, folks might notice the Castle logo up in the top corner of the blog here. I'm one of Castle's uh, official bloggers. And uh, so, Justin, um, I know that you've worked with school leaders both in the face-to-face -face and I know the DOC program has been an online and hybrid program for a number of years So, um, yeah. and, and it's had a strong technology focus there. When you think about sort of how the, the disruption that we've had in this particular school year, regardless if we get back this year or not, what sort of things should school leaders be thinking about so that they can better accommodate a reintroduction back into the classroom, regardless if it happens at the end of this year or at the beginning of next year? So uh, mostly my advice to, to folks is gonna be not for the online school leaders, but everyone else that's leading traditional schools. Um, though everyone else that's leading traditional schools really has seen their teachers be very innovative over the last month and a half, two months. And I think all the leaders should be thinking about what parts of that do we wanna preserve and really just start to make part of our system. So a lot of work has been done on Google Classroom, a, a lot of work uh, on doing choice boards and sort of digital uploading of artifacts. Uh, so that, there's a lot of really strong innovation that has occurred that we wanna preserve. But school leaders also need to start digesting and starting to tell the difference between what's good and what's bad in this online learning sort of period that we're in. Um, some teachers very quickly innovated and adapted great systems that are working for kids and for parents. Uh, but there's also a lot of frustrated kids and parents relative to how teachers are trying to make learning happen in their world. And increasingly there's disengaged kids and parents who are just not even participating in the efforts to try to make school work. So, we're gonna to need to start distinguishing those things. And from a leadership standpoint, be able to say, here is sort of the minimum expectations that we would expect all of our teachers to meet moving forward. Um, minimum communication expectations, minimum instruction expectations, minimum assessment expectations. Uh, it doesn't have to be a super lengthy 42 page you know, document, but conveying to your teachers, like we need, we need this much communication minimally. We need this much instruction from you every week minimally. So I think that's sort of a step that leaders should be engaging in right now, uh, because obviously we're, we're looking at this, the rest of this school year at this point, we're not coming back on site and increasingly looking to the fall of not being back on site either. So we just start to, we need to start getting better at online learning uh, rather than the emergency remote teaching that's happening. Speaking of moving forward, as we do look to next year, you know, one of the things we know about pandemics is they're unpredictable. We'll get local flare-ups. There could be likely to be a second wave. So there's a high likelihood that we'll have individual districts or in some cases entire states, maybe the entire country again that has to shut down a lot of folks were sort of caught with this one and we scrambled. And as you said, teachers yeah. have been doing some wonderful things, but what can school leaders do over the next few months and leading into the new school year so that we can make the next transition a little more seamless? So it's not easy advice. It's hard advice. And um, I know there's a lot of folks yet that are really pushing for everyone to be sort of forgiving of teachers right now, forgiving of school systems right now, 
and, and I acknowledge it is hard. I've got five kids of my own. It's, it's not easy to manage my work life and my home life at the moment. However, we as school leaders, as schools, as teachers, we need to, over this summer, build out a digital backbone on which we can, we can run school either in an on-site way or in an online way when needed. Um, higher ed is actually a pretty good example of this. Not that higher ed had this all figured out. Living in the world of higher ed, there's a lot that we were not prepared for in this pandemic. But that when you think about higher ed, you typically think of most courses have a Canvas shell, or Canvas for us, Blackboard shell, some kind of learning management shell. And maybe the syllabus is posted there. Maybe some of the core online learning modules are posted there. That's where students can upload their work. That's where students will get their grades. Okay, so what that provides is a digital platform on which the learning can move rapidly. So you could, on a Friday, get the call that the a hot spot has emerged and we need to shut it down by Monday. And everyone's already aware of what Monday is going to look like and where do I go for learning on Monday. So that's not easy to do. K-12 has, at scale, never done this. But I got to build a high school from scratch in Lexington called STEAM Academy. One of the very first decisions that we made was to implement a learning management system. All of our teachers have come to rely on it completely. Um, it has become central to who we are and what we do. And when the pandemic hit, learning transitioned easily at STEAM into the learning management system, Zoom meetings, you know, and so we, we adapted pretty quickly. But we were only capable of that adaptation because we had that digital backbone in place. So that's what leaders have to begin to digest and start to put in place. And there's gotta be commonality. Right now we've got every teacher is coming up with their own emergency remote teaching solution. And so one teacher is on uh, a learning management system, one teacher is on Google Classroom, a different teacher is on Remind app, just trying to do the whole thing through texting. So you've got it all, it's all over the place, right? What is the common learning platform for our school gonna be? For middle schools and high schools, I would advise you to move towards some version of a learning management system. And yes, you might have to pay for that. For uh, elementary schools, my advice would probably be more towards Google Classroom um, and platforms like that, which are free, but also at the elementary level, you probably don't need the depth of conveying of the instruction. Uh, at the elementary level, you may still keep a choice board model in place. Uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Jefferson County for us here in Kentucky did a great job of very rapidly deploying an elementary choice board model. Um, so those are things that I think in the near term, we've got to figure out and we've got to begin to embrace that. For me as, next, as the leader of NextGen in Kentucky, we also have to begin to think about what was not working in our systems. Uh, we have examples in Kentucky of learning that is deeper, that led to performance assessments, online student portfolio defenses. We can do learning better that can more easily adapt. That's a longer term play. I mean, I don't wanna, I'm already freaking people out by saying you need a digital backbone by fall. However, there's another step there even beyond that one that I wanna plant that seed for leaders right now because we eventually need to go there too. All right, very good. So this has been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning With and today our with has been Dr. Justin Batham. Thank you, Justin. Yep.